Okay, welcome to our November Thinking Beyond. As usual, I have just a few quick announcements. And um, the first is that this is our last Thinking Beyond of this fall semester, but we will be starting up again next semester in January. And the, we'll do the same day, same time, the last Monday of the month at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So uh, just look out on social media or emails for the announcements for when registration will open. And then as usual, um, this is being recorded and we will post it uh, to YouTube later if you want to rewatch it or share with somebody who you missed it that you think would be interested. And if you have any questions at any time during the talk, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we will get to those towards the end of the hour. And that's all I have. So I will turn it over to the director of the Beyond Center, Paul Davies. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're very thrilled this evening to be uh, having as our guest, uh, Cody McCoy. Uh, Cody started out uh, on the East Coast at Yale and Harvard, and then uh, has moved to Stanford, where she's a science fellow. Uh, but next year, she's going to be moving again uh, to the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago and its uh, marine biology lab. Uh, and this um, uh, takes her uh, to uh, a place where uh, she's going to be able to indulge her interests in the crossover between uh, physics and biology. Uh, this evening, she's going to be telling us about her work on uh, the, uh, the cut, the the color black and the way it plays a role in biology, but her interests are much broader than that. And she can certainly tell you about them uh, and include things like um, uh, evolutionary theory and uh, biophotonics and uh, host symbiont evolutionary conflicts and coral bleaching. So a lot of things of contemporary interest uh, in, the, in the biological world. So I'm not gonna say any more, but uh, hand over to uh, to Cody uh, to uh, invite her to tell us about her work. So Cody, over to you. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Jessica. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. All right, let me first share my screen and get that working. And there's the presentation. Excellent. Yeah, I was so excited to be invited to speak at this seminar because I'm a giant fan of Beyond Center. It's a very rare sort of institute, as Paul and I were just discussing. Um, and it's so wonderful to see so many participants here. So thank you again, Paul. As, as Paul said, I have a lot of interests. Um, but today I want to talk to you a little bit about the color black. And if you attended an earlier seminar, uh, by Malik Parikh, you might have heard a little bit about black holes. And what I wanted to sort of start with here is telling you that I think there are some living black holes in nature, some of these super black animals that I study. So here is where today's story starts. In the sort of mountain jungles of Papua New Guinea, there's a wide variety of beautiful and strange birds of paradise. And here what we're looking at is a male bird of paradise, which might look a little bit like a black hole. Its feathers are so dark, displaying very energetically to a female. And that's the main focus of what I'll talk to you today. What is going on with these strange super black animals? And I'll jump from there to tell you a little bit about some of the underwater photonic geniuses of nature, which are some animals that are actually powered by the sun. And because this is the Thinking Beyond series, I wanna to touch on a few major big questions. What is beauty? These are many animals that we would call beautiful. And in fact, that succeed in life based on being beautiful by attracting a mate. Why do corals bleach? And what can nature teach us about sustainable design? So I wanna play you one more video of these beautiful birds of paradise. And what you'll notice here is a female in the background just flew into view and the male immediately sees his chance to start displaying. So to be a male bird of paradise is a tricky thing because very few males get to mate. And over many, many years of sexual selection, males have evolved to become these absolutely crazy ornate displayers. In fact, I think if you showed this video to a small child, you might not be able to tell you that that's a bird, let alone that's a male, a female bird of the same 
So these beautiful birds of paradise have captivated scientists and citizens alike for many, many years. And the thing they're most famous for is their brilliant colors, which you can see the bright blues and yellows and greens and the incredibly energetic dances they have to do for the you know 10 to 20% of males that manage to ever pass on their, gene their genes. And long ago, a European explorer went to Papua New Guinea and managed to you know get a translator from among the locals who called the birds of paradise, the birds of God. And in fact, these birds were so strange and beautiful that when explorers managed to kind of get a specimen and bring it back to Europe, the feet got damaged in the voyage. So for a long time, European scientists thought that these birds lived their entire lifetime in the air, in the celestial sphere, never alighting. Of course, anyone that actually lived in Papua New Guinea could tell you that they do indeed spend a lot of time on the ground and in trees. But these amazing birds not only have these brilliant colors, but they also, as you can see through these five different species, have incredibly dark black patches. And, you know, got a gigantic smiley face, black shape, but all of them have velvety dark black hole level black uh, in their feathers. And what my colleagues and I showed is that these birds are trapping more than 99.9% of light in their feathers using clever physical strategies. So when we wanted to sort of understand what's the point of all this and how do they make a color so dark that it rivals human-made anti-reflective materials. And one step in the scientific process was to take feathers pluck them from museum specimens and coat them in gold so that we could look at them more carefully under an electron microscope. So if you take a normal blackbird, and this, believe it or not, is pretty much the only bird of paradise that looks like a normal crow. Uh, this is called the paradise crow. So if we took a feather from that bird and coated it in gold, and as you can see in this picture, it turns gold. That's because the color of this kind of bird and the color of my hair and lots of human hair colors comes from a pigment called melanin. So if you cover up the melanin, it can't interact with the light anymore and you don't see the black color. But when we took feathers from the super black birds of paradise and coated them in gold, they looked super black still, despite being coated in a thin layer of gold nanoparticles. So this was a strong suggestion that something really strange and interesting was going on here to create the ultra black color. Now, normal black birds, or if you have a black shirt or black jeans, that type of black thing reflects about 4% of light. And so in case you haven't spent as much time looking at feathers as I have, here's a little diagram. As you zoom in on smaller and smaller regions of the feather, it's kind of like a fractal. So it still looks like a feather. And if you zoom really far in on a tip of one normal black feather, it still looks like a feather. Everything is lying in the same plane. And light interacts with this roughly the same way light interacts with a mirror or a shiny surface. It, a lot of it is just scattered right back off, back into your eye. But super black birds of paradise have incredibly weird natural technologies. So here is a scanning electron microscope image of a super black bird of paradise feather. It has all these strange, weird barbules sticking up with tiny prongs. And here I'll show you another species that looks kind of like a bottle brush or a coral reef. And the way these super black feathers achieve that incredibly deep, dark black color is by multiply scattering light, basically bouncing it around many times. And with each bounce or each scattering event of photons, more and more photons are absorbed. And this is something we showed using some techniques called ray tracing and nano CT, where you can simulate the interaction of light with a 3D structure. And it would look something like this. This is sort of a schematic made for a documentary film where photons enter the feather and get iteratively bounced and bounced and bounced and absorbed. Now, here's the kind of amazing thing. Birds of paradise are not the only bird to evolve super black feathers. Here's a big tree of life, a phylogeny, kind of like a family tree showing all the different times birds evolved super black feathers. And in all these different birds from hummingbirds to ducks, which are very distantly related, 
the super black is always framing or adjacent to bright color. And sometimes it was even within the same feather. Now, when something evolves many times, it's a clue that it's serving a very important purpose for that creature. So think about, you know, sharks and dolphins. That's a very famous example of convergent evolution. They're distantly related, but they both have a torpedo-like shape because that's a really effective way to move through water. So there's something that makes be having super black feathers a really good, a really useful evolutionary advantage, which raises the question, why on earth have these male birds evolved these incredibly intricate natural technologies? Remember, not just black, but blacker than nearly every human-made technology. Maybe you've heard of this product called Vanta Black. Sometimes it makes the rounds in newspapers where you'll see a shiny statue and they coat it in the Vanta Black coating and suddenly it looks completely featureless. You know, why on earth did nature evolve a technology so intricate? Now, there are two levels of why we're asking about here, and I want to flag that. One thing we're asking is, why be beautiful at all? And that's a very interesting question, which we'll talk a little more about later. But there's another question, which is, if you need to be beautiful, and if you know that female birds love bright colors, which we know from lots of behavioral experiments, why evolve incredibly dark black? And I suspect some of you are already guessing the answer. Super black is an evolved optical illusion, which makes nearby colors appear impossibly bright, even like they're glowing. Now, optical illusions work because our eyes and our brains and bird eyes and bird brains aren't seeing a perfect image of the world. The photons that enter our retina and get absorbed and get processed into an image, we're doing a lot of post-processing. And some of the key things we're filtering for and processing for are the color of the light and also the amount of ambient light. So here's one of the most famous optical illusions invented by this guy, uh, Dr. Adelson. Here we have what looks like a checkerboard with white squares and sort of darker gray squares. And you can see the square labeled A looks like it's dark gray and the square labeled B looks like it's light gray. You probably see where this is going. They're actually the same exact color, which is so hard to see because our eyes are controlling for the presence of shadow and artificially inflating the brightness of square B. Maybe some of you remember this famous dress that went around the internet. I don't know, maybe this was five or 10 years ago. The middle image is the image that's most similar to what was shared. And people endlessly debated, is it white and gold or is it black and blue? And the reason it differed so much is because all of us were looking at that picture in different lighting conditions with screens set to different brightness levels. So this is just sort of an example. We are really not seeing some sort of perfect view of the world. And here's another very famous illusion. All of these three cartoon aliens look like they have two different color eyes. But as you can probably guess, in each case, the eyes are the same color and our brains are adjusting for what we perceive to be as the color of the ambient light. Now, one of the most important ways we do these automatic adjustments is by looking at white gleams. So think about hair, it has shiny white gleams on it, or this apple has a shiny white gleam. And in our evolutionary history, we needed to be able to know whether that apple was bright red and therefore ripe and safe to eat, whether it was in a dark shady branch or illuminated by the bright sun. And so our brain automatically processes the information in those white gleams. But super black is specifically so dark that it has almost no white gleams, no specular reflections at all. This means that it's completely messing with our innate systems of color control, creating the intense optical illusion that those nearby colors are so bright and so blue in the shade. It's basically creating the illusion of extremely deep shade. And so the point here is that if you're a bird and you're competing every, you know, every day of your life to try to win a mate, once you've already evolved the brightest possible blue feather allowable by physics, how can you make your colors look even brighter? You can evolve an optical illusion. And here's the really amazing thing. 
birds are not the only beautiful creatures to figure out this trick. And so for those of you who are afraid of spiders, I'm about to show you a picture of a spider, but it might look a little bit different than the spiders you're used to seeing. This is called a peacock spider, so named because the males basically look like elaborate peacocks. Females look brown. Now, peacock spiders are basically the birds of paradise of the spider world. Here I'm showing you just four different species, and you might be noticing, just like the birds of paradise, they have brilliant, incredible iridescent colors, but they also have incredibly dark, super black patches. And these super black spiders are trapping light using a totally different type of structure than the birds use, but with the exact same ecological purpose. So just like the birds of paradise, very few male peacock spiders get to mate, and females are incredibly busy. So here is a sort of video that looks like it was created by some sort of artificial intelligence, but this is a real video of a real male peacock spider doing its best to impress the female with not only its incredible colors, but also its, you know, very refined dance moves. And I'll just show you one more. Something else interesting about these spiders um, that maybe humans could sort of take a lesson from is that the male is playing to a female and she indicates that, you know, she's not interested continues displaying and trying to get into her field of view, can anyone guess what she does? She attacks him and consumes him. So uh, they, she definitely enforces her right. And just to give you a sense of size, these are tiny. So these are truly photonic marvels. They're creating these incredible colors at these tiny size scales. Um, about 10 could fit on your thumbnail, as you can see from this image. So First question, how on earth are the spiders creating such a dark black color with so little material to work with? So a normal black spider has this flat cuticle and it reflects about 5% of light, just like you know the other black things we talked about earlier. But super black spiders have evolved these arrays of micro scale bumps. You can see they look kind of like squashed ellipses. And as you look at a cross section of spider cuticle, you'll notice these little spheres underneath the cuticle. Those are little spheres of melanin pigment. And the way this works is these arrays of micro lenses, first of all, they decrease the amount of light that reflects off the surface. They make it less shiny, but also they focus light, increasing the path length through that absorbing layer of melanin pigment to reflect less than 0.1% of light. So they're reflecting less and absorbing more, which are the exact same goals we have when we design solar panels to harness energy from the sun. So what we showed through a series of parameter sweeps is, and we did these sweeps because this micro lens, you know, you'd expect a micro lens to be shaped like a hemisphere, very round, but these were clearly tailored by evolution to be these squashed ellipsoids. Is that just coincidence or was that evolution fine tuning the lenses for a particular goal? So we wrote down an equation with some parameters that we could vary. And by sweeping over these parameters, we could simulate what would the reflectance be and what would the absorption be if the spiders had evolved a differently shaped micro lens. So the goal of the spider is to be as dark as possible, which means making the blue line reflectance as low as possible, while the red line for absorbance is as high as possible. And what we found is that the spiders, marked by these little circles labeled K and S, were sitting roughly at an optimum where they're absorbing a very high amount of light, but reflecting very little. Move a little bit to the left or the right and you start to lose in one or the other. And the same thing is true, not just for sweeping over the radius, but also the height. So there's something very special going on with this. Um, and we also varied, we, we tested it with hemispheres versus the ellipsoids. And these weird ellipsoids seem to be sitting at a real optimum, which means that we might be able to learn from them. I mean, if you think about it, every single species on earth represents more than a billion years of product design with the harshest critics possible, the cold hand of natural selection. So every species has been tailored to be as efficient as possible at its goal. In this case, at trapping light very effectively. So some of our collaborators um, in Denmark fabricated micro lens arrays inspired by the spiders. Normally when we design micro lenses, we make them hemispheres, 
But it turns out that if you make them these weird ellipsoids, you actually get additional gains. And this is the kind of work that might make solar panels even more efficient or might have other applications to things like, you know, glasses, coatings, or uh, telescope design. This work was featured in a wonderful booklet called How Sustainable Engineering Solutions Depend on Biodiversity. And I think this, there's a lesson here. You know, I'm probably preaching to the choir. We all understand why we need to protect and rebuild nature. It, you know, having biodiverse ecosystems helps clean our water, keep our air clean, provide resiliency against climate change. But every species also represents secrets of sustainable design. And I want to give you a couple of my favorite examples. To design better planes that can move through the air, we have imitated the shape of an albatross wing and the small scale, micro scale surface features of shark skin, which create huge efficiency gains in reducing drag. Bullet trains in Japan were having a sort of problem where as they exited mountains, they would encounter a massive difference in pressure that would create a massive amount of noise and also a big drop in efficiency. There's an animal that constantly has to dive from air to water, another big pressure differential, the kingfisher. And bullet trains were about 30% or more, more efficient when they were modeled after a kingfisher's beak. Another big favorite of mine is the challenge of cooling and heating buildings. The challenge of applying air conditioning to huge office buildings is a massive driver of emissions and a massive you know, economic cost. But termite mounds have been cooling themselves for millions of years without needing any Freon. Um, so by designing office buildings after the self-cooling channels of termite mounds, we've cut down energy costs in certain buildings by a huge amount. So likewise, as, as we start thinking about where else can we look to nature for inspiration, the super black animals that I studied have already started inspiring some very early stage new ideas for designing new solar panels. But there's another area of inspiration, and that's these strange and bizarre solar powered animals, which I think can help us improve solar panels, farm algae more efficiently, and more. Now, when we think about photosynthesis, we usually think about plants. Plants are the kings and queens of the photosynthetic world. But it's little known that photosynthesis actually evolved at least seven different times in animals. So here's a phylogenetic tree showing you several of the different groups of animals that have evolved photosynthesis. And in fact, many of these creatures are living on coral reefs. Now you might notice one obvious exception. Salamanders, we recently discovered when they lay eggs, the eggs have photosynthetic algae inside them, which use solar power to create sugars feeding the developing embryo. But everything else I've listed here thrive on coral reefs. And the way photosynthesis works in these solar powered animals is that they are hosting photosynthetic algae inside their bodies in what we always call a symbiotic partnership. So coral, for example, look like plants or rocks, but they're actually animals. And coral reefs are built around the fact that corals inside their very cells have single-celled algae. Now this is a, basically a very early stage chloroplast or a very early stage mitochondria. There are many moments in evolutionary history when one type of organism was subsumed inside another. I think corals and these other solar powered animals are a very early stage example of this. Now, typically we always describe coral reefs as this beautiful symbiotic partnership between the coral animal and the algae. But if you ask me, it's not clear to me that it's cooperative at all. Some of my current research is focusing on the question of what really is the algae getting out of the partnership or is the coral farming the algae for itself? And this matters because the more symbiotic a relationship is, the more mutualistic it is, the more stable it is in the face of environmental change. So I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I think one reason corals are bleaching so severely all over the world is that they have a very tenuous relationship with their algae. It's not a mutualistic partnership. And Paul invited me to speculate widely, so wildly, so that's why I'm telling you some of my more out there theories about coral. But 
as we think about how mutualistic these solar powered animals really are, I'm just going to give you three examples of three strange animals and how their partnership works with their algae. So the first strange animal is this shelled clam-like creature, clam relative, called heart cockle. And these heart cockles, just like corals, have photosynthetic algae living inside their bodies. But, you know, for corals, all of their tissue is just exposed, exposed to the sun, but also exposed to predation. Heart cockles have a hard shell. So how do they get light in this needed ingredient of photosynthesis to their algae? They actually evolved transparent windows in their shell. And these transparent windows work because the heart cockles have remodeled calcium carbonate, which is that white rocky substance that you see in naked coral skeletons. They've remodeled the crystals of calcium carbonate to make them incredibly long, narrow fiber optic cables. And these fiber optic windows not only transmit sunlight for their, for their photosynthetic partners, but they also protect them from predation. It's hard to eat something when it's inside a hard shell. And they screen out damaging UV radiation, which is a problem if you live in the very shallow tropical seas. So this is somewhat more of a mutualistic symbiosis. And I wanna show you a couple interesting pictures. So here is a shell of a heart cockle, and I just put a couple LEDs inside. So you can see the windows, which in this individual are shaped like big stripes. You can see the light passing through. Here's another individual. They're incredibly diverse with tiny sort of triangle shaped windows, and they vary hugely from species to species and individual to individual. And you can see this little fragment of shell. You can sort of see straight through it. This is an unpolished shell. It transmits these one millimeter thick lines. It even transmits 10 lines per millimeter. And in fact, it even transmits up to 100 lines per millimeter. And what this image, what I'm showing you here is how these amazing little windows not only transmit light, but they're actually projecting images from one side of the shell to the other, which raises a lot of questions. Why? project images when you could just transmit light. So that's kind of an open question for future research. Here's my second example of a solar powered animal. These beautiful tabletop corals grow far more quickly than the heart cockles, but that's probably because rather than existing in a mutualistic symbiosis with their algae, they're essentially farming algae. And the way they do this is they keep their algae in tiny, micro scale grooves in their skeleton. So the light is focused. Basically, it's as if it's a solar concentrator being focused onto the algae. So they can, you know, have many, many more algae per square centimeter than something like a heart cockle can. And the skeleton of these coral is also a photonic marvel. It's one of the most reflective materials um, on the planet. And finally, at the far parasitic end of the question of how mutualistic are these solar powered animals. Here is a beautiful and strange sea slug, which is often affectionately called the leaf sheep, um, maybe for reasons you can guess look, looking at this picture. Some researchers back in, in the early 2000s, maybe around 2010, discovered that these sea slugs are not doing a symbiosis the same way corals do. They're not just letting algae live inside their tissue. They're actually eating the algae, extracting the chloroplasts and doing photosynthesis themselves. So they're basically cutting the middlemen out. And this raises all sorts of interesting questions. This is an animal across you know, the grand kingdoms of life. This is extremely closely related to us. Is there some strange and distant future where we learn from these sea slugs, where we humans become green? where we can come to gain energy from the sun. I think it's not as crazy as it sounds. Again, this is an animal. This is not a plant, even though it looks like it. So to put it all on a spectrum, I think corals are relatively parasitic. The leaf sheep is extremely parasitic where it's parasitizing the algae. Um, and something like the heart cockle is in a more truly mutualistic symbiosis. Now, you know, if you look at a textbook, they'll tell you the coral algae relationship is very mutualistic, very symbiotic. Um, but I'll let you decide for yourself if you think that's true. But just you know, remember, these algae can live on their own out in the world, or they can live inside a coral. The same individual cell 
might find itself living in a coral or living out in the open ocean. If that algae is living out in the open ocean, it photosynthesizes, it makes those energy rich sugars and it uses those sugars for itself. It builds cell walls, it reproduces. Inside a coral, the coral forces the algae to leak between 40 and 90% of the energy rich sugars that it produces. And if it discovers that an algae is not photosynthesizing fast enough, it kills and ejects the algae. So to me, that doesn't sound like very much of a symbiotic relationship. <clears throat> and here is the sort of hypothesis I alluded to earlier. With merely a degree or two of ocean warming in the shallow seas, we're seeing coral reefs catastrophically die worldwide. And coral reefs, you know, they serve so many important functions. They support up to a quarter of all marine life. They feed millions of people with the fish stock they support. They prevent waves from eroding our coastal cities. This is a serious crisis. And I'm arguing that this catastrophic breakdown, this bleaching process by which corals eject their symbiotic algae in huge waves when the temperature warms a little bit, um, and when they eject the symbiotic algae, they soon die because they rely on the symbiotic algae to live. I think that that relationship breaks down so easily with just a few degrees of warming, partially because it's such a tenuous relationship to begin with. And some of the other creatures I showed in that earlier slide that have a more mutualistic relationship, they're doing just fine as the oceans warm. So there's many, many drivers of coral bleaching, but I think one underappreciated driver is how mutualistic is this really? And how easily can this relationship break down? So um, I'd be happy to sort of talk more about that in the question and answer session. <clears throat> so as we move toward a green future, move away from fossil fuels, we talk a lot about designing sustainable technology. But I think we should also think about discovering sustainable technology, learning from the innate creativity of nature over more than a billion years of careful product design encased within every single species. And I just wanted to close by bringing it back to the first big idea I brought up, which is beauty. What is beauty, this nebulous concept? Here we have two animals that are distantly related, a bird of paradise and a spider, and here we are, humans, all of us probably can say that's a beautiful thing. The spiders think those male spiders are beautiful. The, the female birds think those male birds are beautiful. And so do we. There's something beautiful about bright colors on a dark velvet background. That's why jewelers display their gems on a black velvet background. And I think one argument to be made here is that these animals are actually works of art. And so now I want to show you a few comparisons that are partly a joke, but partly real, comparing peacock spiders to famous works of art. So think a little bit, who can name this work of art? I'm not sure, probably I'll, probably there's no easy chat function. I'll just let you think about it to yourselves. Here's a species of peacock spider that is the scream. Think about what this work of art is. Can you name this famous artist? Maratus Voltus is this self-portrait of Van Gogh. And again, these look like they're AI-generated images. These are real. These are some of the many incredible species of peacock spider, which landed upon the same exact beautiful color palettes that the greatest human artists used. Here's another famous work of art. Here's a peacock spider that looks just like King Tut's death mask, down to the turquoise and gold. Here's another beautiful work of art, La Danse by Matisse. And here's the peacock spider that decided to create brilliant red colors framed by bright blue. Even beautiful black and white art is represented among the peacock spiders in this beautiful, well-named Maratus skeletus. This wonderful installation represented in this beautiful black and blue Maratus. And finally, this is one of my favorite artists um, because he's from my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Maratus Robinsoni is a mishmash of pop, pop art, Warhol art. Here's my very favorite of all. This is, as you probably know, Van Gogh's famous Starry Nights, one of the most beautiful works of art, most evocative works of art um, that I know of. Recently, a new species of peacock spider was discovered called Maratus constellatus. 
what is it about the night sky and this combination of deep blue, dark black, and brilliant pinpricks of golden, red, and, and white light? So there's something very interesting going on here. Some of the innate control systems of our brain that process the world make us susceptible to beauty. And these evolved not only in humans and other primates, not only in birds, but even in the distantly related peacock spider. And if these questions about beauty interest you, I strongly suggest you check out two wonderful books, and I'll just tell you briefly about them. In the first one, my friend Rick Prom wrote a book about the evolution of beauty. Now, a prominent theory in biology is that you know, animals are beautiful because they're honestly signaling how healthy they are. So by this theory, something like a peacock or a bird of paradise is investing in its beautiful feathers. And that's telling a female, look how healthy I am. Look how resistant to parasites I am. But what Rick argues in his book is that male birds evolved to be beautiful because female birds like looking at beautiful things. He sort of returns the theory of beauty to its very baseline axiom. Beauty evolves because beauty is appreciated. And stepping to an even more fundamental level, Frank Wilczek, um, who is an ASU Nobel laureate and a wonderful theoretical physicist, recently wrote a book um, looking, looking to find nature's deep design. And he's basically asking, is our world and our universe a work of art? How can being guided by beauty help us come to fundamental truths about the universe? Um, I know in Frank has described in his own work that this has guided, you know, his Nobel winning discoveries of processes and phenomena like asymptotic freedom. So if these questions interest you about what really is beauty, I strongly suggest checking out these books. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much again for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to move on to the conversation portion. Um, and yeah, thank you, Paul. Okay, well, thank you, Katie. That was really wonderful. So thought-provoking. And as you were going through it, I was uh, jotting down questions, but you actually answered most of them on the way, but not, not all of them. Um, and so one, just a, a sort of geographical thing. Uh, I did visit uh, Papua New Guinea uh, some years ago. I don't remember encountering these birds, but do they live uh, in other parts of the world as well? Good question. Uh, they right. do. Yeah, their main home is Papua New Guinea, but they also live in some parts of Australia. And um, I think those are the two main places. I've never actually seen them in the wild, but once when wandering through Australian forests, I heard one of the birds, which was very tantalizing, as you can imagine. Right, right. But, but do, do you find them in zoos or aviaries uh, anywhere in the United States? Yes, they are in some zoos and aviaries. In fact, at the National Aviary, which is in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I strongly suggest visiting Pittsburgh. They have a pair of birds of paradise in the National Aviary. So you can see some of these incredible birds up close there. Now, of course, they're, they're black uh, in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, do they do anything peculiar, you know, in UV or infrared? Uh, what, what happens if you look at them through night vision goggles? Good question. So first of all, they are not colorful in the UV in those black regions, which is a great question because birds can see UV and many birds that look pretty drab to us have brilliant color patterns in the ultraviolet. So great question, but they are, they're not reflecting UV light. But something weird that they might be doing is emitting a lot of energy at infrared and higher wavelengths. Um, because one you know thing you might think with a dark black animal is, isn't it heating up all the time? And might right. that I was be going to a ask problem? You exactly that. Yeah, don't they get hot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Um, and it doesn't seem like they do. And a few researchers working on a different species, a butterfly, found some results that they do some sort of radiating the energy at higher non-visible wavelengths, which I think needs a little bit more, it deserves more study because it's such a cool result. But I think that's one thing to say. And then the other thing to say is. A lot of the birds, as you might have seen in those videos, they're not super black all over at all times. They have specialized capes that they flick out when it's time to display. So that's probably another way that they don't heat up or you know just expose their, their good black feathers to the elements all the time. They're sort of specialized purpose. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so you talked a bit about um, uh, technological applications and uh, energy efficiency and so on. 
Um, but is there a case for uh, coat, using this uh, blackness to coat buildings in cold places so that they can trap more uh, more sunlight and uh, and heat? That's a great idea. I have never thought of that till this moment. Good idea, Paul. Yeah, I think there is <laughs> for sure. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Certainly the reverse has been done with, there's a couple, there's one beetle that's incredibly bright white and people synthesized a paint inspired by those beetles, which if you coat buildings with it, saves massively on cooling costs. So I love this idea. Why not also try to save on heating costs? Yeah, you should uh, you should research it. Let me know what you find. <laughs> right. It's not such a problem in Arizona. I have to yeah, say. true. Um, <laughs> but maybe in Massachusetts or Pittsburgh. Yep. Um, so so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the coral bleaching because it is such a problem. And I've always put this down to... Um, you know, UV penetration or something, uh, but uh, but clearly it's not that. It's so so. Your theory is at least part of this is that the uh, all important algae um, uh, find it uncongenial in slightly warmer water, and uh, and so this symbiotic uh, relationship breaks down, uh, which which means the corals are very uh, temperature sensitive. Um, but I do have to wonder uh, in, in past episodes of uh, global temperature change and sea level change, uh, that the corals somehow came through all that, or maybe they moved to other places and then recolonized the original or something of that sort. Um, so I suppose this is a rambling way of saying, uh, with this insight, what can we do uh, to improve the, the outlook for corals like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia? Oh, great question, because we need to do something and people are doing amazing things. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it depends on your personality. I am pro intervening at a large scale with the environment, which is, you know, a controversial topic. But I think, you know, Beth, Beth Shapiro is a wonderful sort of paleontologist and scientist at UC Santa Cruz. She put it well in an interview I saw recently. She was quoting someone else whose name escapes me, but the quote is, well, the, the prompt for the quote is, should we really be playing God? And the response is, we already are. We might as well be good at it, which I, I think there's some truth there. We're intervening at a giant scale. So one thing I'm very excited about is experimentally evolving algae. So, you know, coral are slow growing and they're slow reproducing, but algae are very fast growing, fast reproducing, which means right. you can evolve so, them in the lab. That's what I had in mind. You could engineer a, a replacement that would be uh, happier at the higher temperatures or something. Exactly, right. And perhaps yes. you can start to understand the genetic underpinnings of what makes a symbiosis more stable, more mutualistic, more you know evenly sharing resources right. rather than more exploitative. That's at least the idea, yeah. And talking about uh, evolutionary relationship, I was going to ask you about the, so the, the color black, coming back to that, uh, you say has evolved many times. It's an example of convergent evolution, um, but uh, uh, presumably um, the, some people at least have studied the genes, the code for this uh, these uh, microstructures. Uh, is it as uh, a simple thing? You know, there's a gene for black and that's it, or or is it entire suites of genes? And how much is understood about the genetic basis for, for these structures? Good question. So the genetic basis of those structures, no one understands it. No one has studied it, actually, oh. believe it or not. But um, we know a lot about the genetic basis of normal color, like normal black color, which is encoded by a couple of genes that are easy to manipulate. But I think the most tractable system to think about what the genetics of this kind of thing are would probably be in butterflies because they're so diverse. There's many butterflies that have super black patches and brilliant blue patches. So that's, I'm kind of just waiting for the, there's a bunch of great butterfly labs. I'm sure they'll publish some cool papers on this in the next five or 10 years. Now I'm gonna move on to some of the questions that have come in whilst you've been talking and one or two uh, from before. So I'm gonna take uh, Barbara Temple's a question first on the screen because she sent some in advance, but I think you actually answered most of them. Uh, she's now asking that uh, the textbooks claim that coral, uh, the coral algae relationship is mutualistic. Um, and uh, 
what you know what do they say about uh, the benefits for the for the algae side of that yeah great question thanks barbara the general story for the benefits for the algae which is a good story is first of all they get shelter from being gobbled up um, and filter fed you know the many creatures that filter feed on reefs but also that they get essential nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the coral animal and the thing about coral reefs is they thrive in extremely nutrient poor waters the oceanic equivalent of deserts i guess similar to where you are probably in arizona that's where coral reefs live and they manage this because of photosynthesis so i think these are the the things they really get are the nutrients nitrogen and phosphorus but you know what they're losing is an awful lot as well um but that's that's the short answer yeah now um we have a rather philosophical question from an anonymous attendee. Um, uh, do these animals, who we're talking about the black ones, the super black ones, um, do they have any awareness of these uh, super black abilities? Well, of course, we don't know what goes on in the, the minds of, um, uh, of a bird, but I, I suppose uh, by analogy with humans, you could say, uh, you know, are they, I, clearly that these, um, the display uh, uh, routines, which you were uh, demonstrating in the little video clip, um, uh, you know, seem to be well orchestrated. But uh, do, does it amount to more than that? Do you ever ever think what's what's going on in their in their minds? Paul, oh, I think about what's going on in animal minds like twenty percent <laughs> of every day. I think it's such a fascinating question. Yeah. So. First of all, I think male birds definitely know what they're doing when they're displaying. Do they know it's an illusion? Who knows? But one thing they do is they make sure they are facing the female. And that's because the illusion works by far the best if it's viewed from dead on. So they're right. constantly repositioning. Right. But a couple other interesting insights. One, male birds prefer to display nearby to other males that are a little bit uglier than they are oh, so this has been carefully oh, shown oh, and they in fact do better when they do that so you know it's always very tempting to move apply that sort of logic to humans but they like to look good compared to their peers um and there's so many studies i did one study on the mind of birds showing that the famous tool makers of the bird world, these new Caledonian crows, which fabricate hook tools and stick tools, mm. that they feel happier mm. after they use a tool, much like we feel happier after we play a sport or do a crossword puzzle. You know, so I, I think, you know, we we give animals far too little credit. There's massive amounts of cunning and emotion and strategy and intellect going on inside even the tiny little peacock spider brain, let alone a, a bird brain. Well, it does occur to me, uh, in connection with this question, that if one of these birds, for some reason, you know, got dirty, it's got something splashed on its uh, on its black parts, um, you know, does it get distressed and uh, does it realise that this is uh, a problem? <laughs> great question. Somebody should, you're coming up with like 10 great research ideas here, Paul. Someone should go, you know, paint a little removable paint on one right. part of the bird and see, does it hide that part? Does it yes. clean it immediately? Yes. My guess is they would clean it immediately, but you know, but I always wonder, even with a robin pretending it broke its wing to lure a predator away from its nest, does it know what it's doing? You know what I mean? Or is it right. just following right. its instinct and in many cases, they know what they're doing, but that kind of thing's a hard one. Like, how did it know? It suggests some very high level thinking if they're plotting the, right. to that level. Yeah, exactly. Well, now let me move on to a question by uh, Patricia. Um, do you think we'll hit an upper limit to biomimicry, um, a point of uh, diminishing returns for novel phenotypes? And could there be a new incentive for astrobiology? So we go look on other planets and, you know, we see uh, other examples of of, Ooh. Uh, biomimicry. I love it. Well, first of all, I do think, I think biomimicry has a lot. We can still, we can learn a lot from nature still, but human engineers are very smart. So yeah, I don't think that this is the solution to all global crises. Certainly I would take any incentive to, you know, do more astrobiology and encourage more astrobiology. That's a great one. I never, a great reason I never thought of before learn more from life on other planets. Um, but I think the sort of philosophical call to explore the universe is even greater than the the idea of what what can we learn for a practical use. But but who knows? Uh, you know, we can learn anything. 
I should mention that Steve Ruff uh, asked a question that I already asked you, so we won't uh, about the, the other wavelengths. Um, <clears throat> another question from Barbara um, about the relationship between you know black, these super black animals and the physicist concept of the black body, uh, which you read about in the textbooks. Uh, and you always think, well, what are these black bodies and how do I find one? Uh, so I, I guess uh, uh, we could turn that into a question about um, when you when you look at the textbook uh, discussion of black bodies, would the uh, surface features of some of these super black animals uh, come close to recapitulating the physical all the all the physical properties, not just absorbing? Um, you know, if you if you put them in a in a chamber or something, would they uh, equilibrate? It? some temperature with a plank spectrum. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is a fascinating question. And I there's that one research group whose name escapes me that have started asking this question for the super black butterflies. And I'm sure they're still working on it, but that's the place to look. And um, feel free to email me, whoever asked that question, and I can send you the paper right, I'm thinking of. Was, but we don't fun. know yeah. yet is the short is the short answer. Yeah. yeah. <gasps> Um, and uh, and you mentioned about the uh, the, the butterflies. Um, so uh, there are examples of super black butterflies, are there? Um, and uh, yeah. it, it, uh, so uh, of course I'm reminded of the old story about the uh, dirty uh, chimneys in England and the, and the cabbage white butterflies, and then this these mutants that were black, and so they fare better against the black chimneys. Um, but I, and I was going to ask, well, isn't being totally black actually a bad strategy for a butterfly? You think it would get eaten. But then when I think about the fact that they've got all these bright colors, then uh, anyway, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what the story is, is that um, whether yeah. black is good or bad. But presumably the, these black butterflies that um, I just mentioned uh, uh, have, have a strategy that they're... They, yeah. Um, they're not doing it for fun. Yeah, yeah. They well, most of the black butterflies have dark black right next to brilliant color, just like the animals I showed today. So most of them are either or both poisonous or toxic, and so it's a a signal to predators: I'm really bad for you. Don't eat me. Like you know how vividly colored things in nature are often toxic. But also sometimes there are sex differences in butterflies, actually often, where the females look different than the males. And so this could also be a case of sexual selection where females are choosing the mates um, to be beautiful looking. Um, no one has tested this yet, but Alex Davis, who was recently a graduate student at Duke University, started testing butterfly preferences. So, you know, that's that remains to be seen. But um, so while butterflies, it's mostly a flashy adaptation, there are super black animals that use it for camouflage. And one of my favorite papers came out maybe two years ago, also by Alex Davis, showing that many deep sea fish that hunt using bioluminescent lures and bioluminescent flashlights in the deep sea where there's no light, they evolve to be super black so that they are not illuminated by their own searchlights. Not only that, but they have extra layers of super black on their stomach because when they eat bioluminescent prey, it would otherwise shine through their stomach and give them away to the bigger fish that's inevitably out there. So the fish have camouflage. There's a type of snake that has super black patches that look like shadows among leaves on the forest floor. So I kind of focused on beauty in this talk, but there's also for sure camouflage out there. And we've got a lot of questions about beauty flooding in and I'll probably have to sort of combine them together, but somebody's also asked, um, so you've been talking about super black, but is there super white out there? There is indeed. There's a bright white beetle. And actually the butterfly, Paul just mentioned, the cabbage white butterfly is incredibly white. And it it wakes up early in the morning before most butterflies can get moving. And it basks in the sun with, it, with its wings at a distinct angle. They concentrate solar power onto its body, which is where its muscles are warming up its wings so it can start flying around uh, before all the other butterflies. So a couple of researchers actually taped butterfly wings onto a solar panel and showed that it increased energy output by like 25%. So 
um, what was the question? Super white. So those are two examples of ultra white animals. Yeah. So uh, Derek is asking uh, whether there's any fossil evidence of these uh, uh, microstructures. Uh, well, I mean, would they fossilize? Uh, they absolutely uh, would fossilize. And I've had a look at some fossil moths, which do have kind of spots preserved. Um, these are fossils that are hard to get a hold of, but I did recently go on a fossil dig in Northern Idaho looking for more insects. I didn't find any, we only found plants on that trip, but stay tuned, Derek, I'm actively digging around in the, <laughs> in the layers to see. So now we've got uh, uh, just a few minutes and, uh, and I must get back to the subject of beauty, which I think fascinates us all. And to a theoretical physicist uh, like me, it tends to be expressed in terms of mathematical beauty. Maxwell's equations or something of that sort. And we often talk about, about that. Um, uh, but uh, another question from, from Barbara relating to that is, uh, uh, did we uh, find beauty in nature or appreciate beauty in nature because it's somehow sort of baked into the very structure of the universe in the mathematical laws that underpin it? So uh, that, I don't know what you think about that. That's a philosophical idea that has been out there for a while that... Uh, you know, like the universe is fundamentally beautiful and it's just a manifestation that we see. Do you have any any thoughts on that? Wow. I Well, for one, I think Frank Wilczek's book starts to approach this. Paul, can I impose upon you and ask you for your thoughts on this? I think you're more qualified to reflect on the mathematical structure of the universe than I am. <gasps> um, well, well, I do. Uh, and I, I personally am very inspired uh, and think it's a very important aspect that uh, humans not only observe the universe, but have come to understand it through mathematics and uh, and uh, experiment, uh, particularly theoretical physics uh, is seems to lead the way. Uh, and we're often guided by it. beauty. Beauty is a guide to truth. And although there's I don't know, no fundamental law to say that's always got to be a successful strategy, uh, it has certainly proved to be so. Uh, for a very long period of time. Now, some people shrug this aside and say, oh, it's just that we're finding symmetry and symmetry has, uh, recognizing symmetry, symmetry has good survival value in biology and we just sort of see it elsewhere in nature. But I think the deep underlying mathematical beauty of, of things like um, uh, gauge invariance, uh, for example, uh, it, it goes deeper than that. So I think um, I think beauty is, a bridge between uh, the hu human, the human mind, and uh, the the deep structure of the universe. But this is a rather sort of mystical view, and I'm I'm simply expressing a personal opinion. Um, we, we we just have like one minute to go. I uh, um, there's so many fascinating questions. I I there's one that is um, uh, sort of an entertaining thing to think about that humans find uh, certain animals or, or plants. Beautiful, but uh, but do animals find humans beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think my two second answer is probably not. <laughs> but I bet you they would find Van Gogh's art beautiful. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> well, look, we've we've had a really good uh, discussion. There are a few more questions, but I think uh, we've covered most of the important points. So it just remains uh, for me to thank you very much again uh, to wish you every success in your transition to. Chicago, uh, and uh, in this uh, line of research, which I shall continue to follow very closely. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom with us this evening. And with that, I will let you, uh, I was going to say, go and have your dinner, but you, you said that you'd had it earlier, but I, I'm going to go and have mine anyway. So uh, good night to you, Cody, and uh, to everybody else. Thank, thank you. you so much, Paul. What an honor and pleasure. And thank you, attendees. All right. Take care. Yeah.